company. Uh, over the past few years, Dr. Tirani worked as a co-director at the Teldon Excavations and is responsible for the public, uh, study and publication of the Iron II findings for more than 50 years of excavation at Teldon. Uh, Dr. Tirani is also part of our NYU community. She's the director of archaeology at NYU Tel Aviv and has very successfully guided our research and teaching program related to the, to the site of ancient Caesarea that is being undertaken uh, at NYU Tel Aviv. Dr. Trani's research is aimed at clarifying the cultural response to various control, control strategies, empires, and local kingdoms, and their reflection in the archaeological record. We are going to hear more about that today in her talk entitled Strangers in a Promised Land in the Footsteps of the Assyrian Deportation to the Southern Levant. Please join me in virtually welcoming Dr. Tirani uh, today. Thank you, Alex. Thank you. Um, first, I would like to thank Alex for uh, giving me the opportunity to contribute an hour or so of Assyrian terror and glamour uh, in this uh, somewhat challenging hour, global hour. I hope you will enjoy it. The lecture today uh, will reflect part of uh, my project until then, uh, and I hope you will enjoy it. So let's start. Ancient imperial quests for new territories were always involved in inflaming dramas. The Assyrian conquest of the Levant brought terror and anguish to the local kingdoms and was followed by large-scale deportations. Behind the formalized inscriptions, one can still hear the loss and agony in which the deportees were given. Leaving the ruined cities behind, no one felt the consequences of deportation more than the deportees themselves who were forced to severe ties to their place of residence and to reorganize their lives in an unfamiliar territory. While it is broadly accepted that Assyria exercised deportations from and to the southern Levant, only few written sources directly attesting to the presence of deportees have been found. In the absence of documents, material culture remains a silent testimony for these dramatic events. It is the aim of my study to explore archaeological manifestations of imperial deportations through the case study of Tel Dan. Uh, sorry. Sorry, I think I missed something. Excuse me. I know. Excuse me, there is some something happened with my, just a moment, please. I'm sorry. No problem, no problem. Thank you. Yeah, okay, I'm sorry, I was, I was okay. Thank you. Okay. Large scale deportations were not invented by the Assyrians. Um, the practice of uprooting sizable groups of people had long been known with the inception of complex societies in Egypt, Mesopotamia, and Anatolia. However, under the Neo-Assyrians, mass deportation became a regular feature of imperial policy, with far-reaching political, demographic, and cultural implications. A long-lived empire, the practice of deportation was not homogeneous throughout Assyria's history and was dependent upon geopolitical conditions in the occupied territory, as well as the individual policy of each ruler. Other than few biblical references to Assyrian deportations in the days of the Assyrian kings, Tiglat Pileso III, Sargon II, and Sennacherib, only a few archeological objects discovered in the Southern Levant attest to the presence of people whose language and script were Akkadians tablet bearing Mesopotamian names and cylinder seals from Samaria, contracts from Tel Hadid, Gezer and Samaria, a tablet from Tel Kisan reporting distribution of rations and the symbol of Sin, the moon god of Haran. The appearance of carinated bowls and bottles with parallels in the imperial heartland and provinces at sites in the southern Levant has traditionally been seen as direct outcome of Assyrian political domination. First identified by Flinders Petrie at Tel Jeme, 
as imitations of Assyrian style vessels, these forms are characterized by their well navigated clay, thin wall, and carinated shape recalling metal bowls. Vessels similar to those have since been uncovered throughout the Levant and on both sides of the Jordan River. Petrographic analysis performed on imitations of Assyrian ware well have proved that in all cases such vessels were made from local clay. Resemblance between vessel types unearthed at Dor and Samaria and other found in the Chabur Triangle and the Assyrian Urartian border have been considered to reflect deputies moved south from the latter territories. Based on the geographic distribution of these sites, Naaman and Sadok argued that Babylonian deportees were located along the Via Maris, the important road leading from the northern coast and uh, the Jezreel Valley south to the coast of Philistia, and uh, that those were the places to which Sargon II deported Babylonians following his campaigns to, Babil to Babylonia. While the potential implication of archaeology of deportations affects understanding of local histories and indigenous survival and shed light on global trajectories of imperial expansion, colonialism and resistance, identification of deportees in the archaeological record is extremely difficult. First, it is closely related to the problem of recognizing ethnicity through material culture and touches the question of cultural contact or colonialism. Replacing colonial situations for other cultural contexts underwrites misunderstandings of indigenous population and bears the risk of falling into the equation of pots and people. Unlike archaeology of the New World, current methodological tools that are used to explore deportations in the archaeology of the Near East are often too general guided by intuition or concentrated in specific historical events. The mute and partial evidence from the Southern Levant, the lack of quantitative analysis, the absence of prototypes originating from the imperial core and the dearth of text all have limited research and methods. Clearly, any effort to identify deportees in the archaeological record requires, requires sorry, a contextual and cross-cultural approach in which the ceramic repertoire is analyzed in a broad systematic framework. After all, foreign material culture styles may find their way to local ceramic repertoires in various circumstances. How then to tell when imperial materials and styles are relevant to deportation rather than associated with the presence of an imperial personnel or emulation of the imperial core by the locals? In order to answer these questions, the average 2 BC material culture assemblage from the city of Dan will be presented. Dan is located on one of the largest water sources in the Middle East on the ancient road that led from Phoenicia to Damascus. First excavated in 1966, the rich Neo Assyrian layer, Stratum 1b at Dan, has great potential for understanding the socio economic role that deportees played in the imperialization project and the traces this policy left on the local archaeological record. The Assyrian conquest in 733 BCE resulted in a fierce conflagration of Stratum 2a, leaving Dan in ruins. Following the destruction, Dan and the Hula Valley were annexed to Assyria and were included within the province of Megiddo. A big, unfortified city was founded at Dan, incorporating public buildings and paved streets. Under Assyrian patronage, Dan became more populous than ever, with the settlement growing to circa 200 dunam. Intensive housing reached the top of the ridge around the site and residential neighborhoods occupied most of the mound. A monumental building dominated by a grand pilaster wall was exposed in the northern part of the Tel. Long corridors and open courtyards led to several units. Two wings were discerned. In the northern wing, there was a kitchen with a hole in the floor, leading to a subterranean space with a water channel. A courtyard and a storage basement with an arch style stone ceiling and a pillar. In the southern wing, was a reception hall in addition to service and storage rooms, two courtyards and a possible living room. Recently, I suggested that this pilaster building represents part of an Assyrian edifice, the residence of the neo-Assyrian governor of Dan. 
Transition to the Assyrian period, Adan, was characterized by continuation of local ceramic traditions along the introduction of new styles. Comprising the bulk of the repertoire, the use of local forms attests to a continuous presence of indigenous population. At the same time, new forms that echo Syro Mesopotamian types appear shallow bowls, round carinated bowls, a crater with protruding handles, a saucer lamp, bottles. Ishikan, which is a, a drinking vessel, you can see it here in number, number seven, um, decorated amphoriscus over here, and the Eurostorja and the Pitoy. Parallels can be found in the Assyrian provinces of Tel Khalaf, this area. The Assyrian provinces of Tel Khalaf, Karkemish, Dukaklimu, Tilbarsip, and Zinjirli, and in the Assyrian capitals, such as Nimrud and Ninveh. Though petrographic analysis of various Assyrian vessels found in the southern Levant have shown they were made of local clay. While Assyrian ware was found in small quantities at Dan, Assyrian types are scattered across most of the Spatum 1B city. Vessels from three urban contexts were analyzed, the Assyrian residents of area T1, the domestic neighborhood of area K, and uh, the industrial and domestic zone of area M. Assyrian and Syrian wares were unearthed in diverse contexts, from dwelling areas to elite house, from industrial installation to residence of an Assyrian governor. Here, Assyrian vessels were found in a kitchen, in an open courtyard, and in two different storage spaces. More than 50% of the vessels were found at Area M, the big neighborhood in the center of town. The Assyrian residence, which is smaller, compri comprised 35% of the vessels a high percentage that attests to their preference within the imperial enclave. The distinctive shapes designed for eating, drinking, serving, storing, and lightning, whereas the absence of silver Mesopotamian cooking ware stands out. What drove the demands for these vessels? And what was the cultural context of their consumption? Any attempt to understand these patterns must take into account the historical scenario, namely the annexation of Dan to the Assyrian Empire, Empire, its function as a provincial center, and the emergence of Assyrian and Syrian forms in various contexts. How should this phenomenon be understood? In order to explore the agency and manner by which Assyrian forms and style found their way to the ceramic assemblage of Dan, two imperial case studies, different in time and space, in which cultural change took place, will be reviewed. The Egyptian domination in Canaan and the Romanization of the Near East. Late Bronze Age 2B saw the intensification of Egyptian cultural traits at Canaan. Notable among this was an increasing number of imported Egyptian ware, though smaller comparing to the locally produced Egyptian pottery. Most of the Egyptianized pottery was produced for daily use. Two paradigms were offered to understand this cultural phenomenon. Direct rule, according to this view, an Egyptian colonial response to local Canaanite residents brought extensive Egyptian personnel that settled in southern Palestine in garrisons and administrative centers where Canaanites and Egyptians coexisted. And elite emulation. In this paradigm, only few Egyptian outposts existed, whereas in other sites, local Canaanites elites borrowed Egyptian elements that were associated with power and prestige and assimilated to the Egyptian rulers. While the elite emulation model fits well the appearance of Egyptian type prestige goods, it falls in explaining the presence of locally Egyptian style household wares. Given that some of the locally produced Egyptian types imitate the Nile clay, it seems reasonable to assume that low prestige Egyptian goods provide evidence of physical Egyptian presence in the South and Levant. Colonial Egyptian population consumed Egyptian pottery produced by Egyptian potters brought from the homeland. The transition of Palestine from a small district to a subject territory of the Roman Empire in the first century BCE was accompanied by a visible change in local material culture. New urban centers were adorned by Roman monuments, while consumption of new Greco-Roman forms and styles not previously known in the region was introduced in the domestic level. Traditionally, Rome's cultural influence in the local Mediterranean communities has been seen as the outcome of one of two models. 
According to the direct Roman influence model, this view promoted the idea that the identity of the conquered was altered with that of the Romans and that the Roman imperial cultural expressions are the result of direct ideological, political, and an economic imperial strategy. Cultural assimilation, previously defined as Romanization, this approach highlights the complex relations between the empire and its subject territories and argues for a dialectical process in which local elites chose to adopt Roman practices. Indigenous populations emulated to the Romans in multiple attempts to define and redefine their identity. Roman cultural influence on the Rhodian Palestine is attested through various objects imported and locally made. Counted among these are the Roman amphora and the Italian cooking ware that were imported from the imperial core and that were intended for use by the local elites. Eventually, these vessels inspired production of local imitations. To sum up, in both discussed imperial eras, Ramesside Canaan and Roman Palestine, ceramic ware that originated from the imperial core was found in the subject territory. The presence of the original imported objects shows that assimilation processes were at play, that they stimulated local demand, eventually leading to local production. Clearly, in order for local population to culturally assimilate with an empire, prototypes originating from the imperial core must be found in the local market. In this way, foreign forms are introduced in the new land and new styles are distributed and adopted by wide-ranging social classes. Comparing Neo-Assyrian cultural influence on the Southern Levant with that of other imperial culture highlights a number of issues. First, local material culture assemblage of the Southern Levant in general and of Tel Dan in particular are characterized by the absence of vessels and objects originating from the Assyrian heartland. Petrographic analysis performed on imitations of Assyrian proved that in all cases, such vessels were made from local clay. The eve of the Assyrian campaigns to the Southern Levant, the traditional pottery in Palestine didn't own the technological knowledge and experience required for the production and decoration of Assyrian style pottery. Characterized by distinctive forms and made of well navigated clay, Assyrian pottery first appears at subsequent occupational layers dated to the Neo-Assyrian period. Moreover, Assyrian ceramic ware done is not an isolated phenomenon. It appears after the conquest of the city with an era of material cultural expression, a drastic change in the settlement pattern, appearance of residents of an Assyrian governor, faunal remains attesting to new behavioral patterns, locally produced vessels that are aligned to the local assemblage, new ceramic tradition, new construction technologies. All this attests to a profound change that took place in the provincial city. Finally, the presentation of vessels associated with drinking and serving, personal adornment and storage facilities indicate new necessities of dance urban community that are connected to imperial ceremonies, banquets, communal activity, conspicuous consumption, and administrative needs. When the archaeological evidence is, in, is integrated with the historical records, the context supports the arrival of new group of people with administrative and cultural needs that had not been familiar at the site. With the local ceramic workshops not able to meet the new demand, importing craftsmen from abroad was only a natural step from the empire's point of view. Removal of groups distinguished by ethnicity, religion, or profession was a primary motivation in the Imperial Act. Deportations were justified by the desire to unify the world under Imperial scepter and to defend and promote elite interests involving the imposition of fiscal and labor obligations, whether specialized craft production, military service, agriculture, and corvée labor. Two main stages of deportation can be deserved. First movement of population followed by resettlement and acclimatization process. Aimed at breaking the spirit and socio-political structure of conquered communities, Assyrian deportations cleared the way for the expropriation of local elites' property and the construction of a new colonial system. Still traumatized by the horrors of the Assyrian war and the loss of their homes, Deportees were soon obliged to cope with physical journeys fraught with tribulation. 
months of wandering to an unknown destination made these people dependent on their imperial overloads. Those who tried to escape risk falling into the hands of an Assyrian force charged with capturing refugees. Most iconographic representations of deportees in the Assyrian reliefs were subjected to imperial artistic convention and a relatively limited set of emotional expressions. One exceptional example is a relief from the Northwest Palace of Ashur Nasir II at Nimrud, where three lamenting women and a child are being sent away by an Assyrian soldier. The agony and loss of the deportees are clearly conveyed through these images. Numerous reliefs and texts refer to belongings that the deportees took with them. Among these are metal cauldrons attested to by written sources and visual representations. An Assyrian text discussing Hulian deportees and their movable property also mentions metal cooking pots, but no ceramic vessels. It thus seems that metal cooking pots were commonly chosen by deportees facing their arduous journey. Ceramic vessels, however, are never mentioned and were most likely left behind. This insight should affect our expectations for deportees in archaeology. Accounts of Armenian deportees from 1915 provide a later equivalent. Most Armenians were given by the Ottomans a period of a week or two to prepare for their journey. Rich families hired carts or donkeys to carry their possessions. Poor families, however, took only what they could carry, which was very little since many of them had children to, who needed to be cared for. Deportees from Chanakal in the Constantinople area describe this harsh moment. We had one donkey where my little brother would sit on, this, on one side with a water pot and I on the other side to balance. Otherwise, mother and father would take turns carrying us on their backs. An imperial interest to bring the deportees safe and sound to their destinations necessitated the creation of supporting network that will take care of the maintenance and needs of these traumatized groups. A relief found in Ashurbanipal's palace at Nineveh show Elamite de shows Elamite deportees on the journey from their homes, seated on low cushions and eating food in individual portions or reaching into a common vessel. Acknowledging the economic value of deportees, the Assyrian carefully executed the relocation of this group and took care of their physical well-being. A letter of an Assyrian official to Diglat Bileser III support this view. As for the Arameans about whom the king my lord wrote to me, prepare them for the journey. I will give them their travel provisions, sackcloth, leather bags, sandals, and oil. My donkeys are not available, but if my donkeys were available, I would offer my calves too for the journey. Upon arrival to their destinations, deportees were integrated in the new land. Now Assyrian citizens, they were encouraged to build homes and cultivate fields, either by incentives such as land grants or by, thre by threats. The speech of an Assyrian governor referring to group deported from Bit Adini to Babylon reveals this method. Now they are at peace and are doing their work. I send them out of six fortresses saying go, one and all, each to a field, let him build, let him settle. Between these lines reveal the nuances of Assyrian deportation policy. Rather than simple mass deportation, this was a preference for selective force transfer with a colonizing mission. The empire had a clear interest in rapid, quiet resettlement of the deportees. Resettlement of indigenous population and deportees in a provincial center was carried out until the open eyes of imperial emissaries. The settlement pattern in an annexed territory was adjusted to meet imperial needs, favor, favoring the development of one urban center that would soon turn into an imperial metropolis. Such centers were populated by indigenous inhabitants of the city and hinterland, intermingling with foreign deportees and imperial officials. It was at about this time that many Near Eastern societies saw the emergence and spread of neo-Assyrian pottery. 
Under Assyrian auspice, provincial centers experienced prosperity and colonizer, colonized and colonists had no choice but to coexist. What happened to deportees upon arrival in such unfamiliar metropolises, crowded with strangers? A fair analogy from the Middle Assyrian period can be offered as an answer. Situated in the upper Balikh Valley, Tel Sabi Abiyad became an Assyrian donum center in the 13th and 12th centuries BCE. A settlement where agricultural estates were administered by Assyrian officials or granted to Assyrian elites. Textual and archaeological evidence from Tel Sabi Abiyad indicate the presence of Shuberian deportees who lived in a separate location, the Donum of the Shuberians. In another time, and farther to the southwest, the presence of deportees and war prisoners in southern Levantine site is evidence from neo-Assyrian sources and the archaeological record. It has been suggested that the emergence of Assyrian forms in the local ceramic repertoire reflects the presence of deportees. Petrographic analyses of neo-Assyrian ware have not detected any Mesopotamian prototypes, meaning that none of these vessels was imported from Assyria. Moreover, textual and visual representations of the personal goods of deportees also suggest that they didn't bring ceramics on their arduous forced journeys. Enriched by this insight, we shall return now to our initial question. Who was responsible for the production, transport, transport and consumption of Assyrian-style vessels in the newly conquered territories? Ancient Near Eastern societies had seen specialist craftsmen working under larger political bureaucracies over, ever since the early Bronze Age. Naturally, people who used their skills for the state's benefit were largely dependent on the administration that provided them with food, shelter, raw materials, and professional tools. From the late 3rd millennium BCE, various imperial powers exercised deportations of specialists and artisans during military campaigns. Mesopotamian documents refer to the displacement of goldsmiths, jewelers, construction workers, shipwrights, weavers, and chariot drivers as part of efforts to maximize profits. Substantial pottery mobility across the Middle Assyrian Empire is attested in the evidence from Tel Sabi Abiyad. A number of ceramic workshops, including several well-preserved kilns, offer insights into the ceramic production, including the construction and operation of such workshops. At the same time, Shuberian deportees still produced and used their own material culture according to their own tradition. One tablet mentions the potter, a regional functionary, Mudamek Ashu, asked the steward of the Donu why he didn't order the brewer to send the potter to Duni Ashu. Postgate suggests that the request to send the potter to Duni Ashu indicates that local production was unsophisticated and unable to meet Assyrian elite's demands. A strong cultural continuity in text, iconography, and material culture between the Middle Assyrian and the Neo Assyrian period is shown through administrative texts. A Neo Assyrian administrative letter refers to Umane, among whom are Megare, carpenters, and Pahare, potters. Most likely, deportees stand for building operations at Dursharukim. Included within the territory of the Assyrian Empire, the professional activities of specialized craftsmen were in high demand, not only in the Assyrian heartland, but in the provinces as well. Craft reflects the impact of tradition to which it relates. It embodies the considered use of materials employed with a degree of skill, concern for the function of the subject of the of the object, sorry, and aesthetic values. Mobility of artisans convey a message about their identity, traditions, and adaptation to new socio-political and economic environment. Two cross-cultural comparanda, the role that American potters play, the, sorry, <laughs> the role that Armenian potters played in the Ottoman Empire and the story of Mexican potters in Chicago shed light on cognitive aspects of potter's mobility and the production of foreign ceramic forms in global environment. Situated in Western Turkey, the city of Kutaya populated many Armenian artisans. From the 14th century onward, the city became a ceramic production center with its products favored by Ottoman elites. 
Armenian artisan traveled across the empire with kutaya wheel tiles and ceramic adoring religious and public monuments such as the Kuyumjian Mosque and the Chinili Kursk at Constantinople and the Armenian Cathedral of St. James in Jerusalem. At that time, Armenians were defined by the Ottomans as a unified community according to their religious, ethnic, linguistic feature, but even within the confines of the Armenian millet, the atmosphere was open to cultural innovations. Armenian potters navigated throughout the imperial space with their craft producing identity within the Ottoman system. In this sense, Kutaya ware was a physical memory of Armenian identity that was constantly redefined through practice. Founded in 1889, the whole house complex became home to recently arrived Mexican immigrants to Chicago. The 20s and the 30s saw the development of a pottery art studio, whole house skills. By 1930, a large community of Mexican immigrants was developed in the densely packed and impoverished whole house. In the years that followed, some of these immigrants were taught ceramics at the whole house skins. Practicing this craft enabled immigrants to connect traditions from their homeland with a new experience in Chicago. Combining craft knowledge with skills, they served as advocates for their own culture by exercising resistance and negotiation. All house kins functioned as a socializing agent, alleviating the life conditions of immigrants and enabling artistic manifestation of their ethnic origins. The fusion of craft knowledge from Mexico with that learned at Chicago reflects immigrants' experience adjusting to new life in a new setting. In what way can these cases be relevant to the study of the ancient Near East? The emergence of the Assyrian Empire brought about a new model of bureaucratic organization. Spatum 1 Biedan dates to when the city became part of the neo Assyrian provincial system. Stung into submission by the horrific Assyrian conquest, the silent majority that comprised the bulk of Dan's inhabitants formed no political obstacle to imperial economic ambitions and eventually even participated in the imperial enterprise. From the new ruler's point of view, it was local elites, experts, and former administrators that presented the greatest potential risk of resistance and trouble. Therefore, those groups were most likely to be targeted for deportation. It is likely that elite members, artisan and experts from Dan were included among the list of deportees from the Galilee in 733 BCE. At about the same time, the, same time, the valley saw the arrival of new groups sent by the empires. The newcomers included elites, experts and artisans from syro mesopotamia regions who were forced to leave their homes and march westward. Colonization of the Hula Valley involved the settlement of imperial personnel with administrative needs and ceremonial norms which were not previously known in the region. Being unable to satisfy such necessities of Assyrian imperial bureaucracy and luxurious consumption, local production had to be bolstered by craftsmen sent from the Assyrian heartland or home provinces. This foreign manpower had both the technological knowledge and experience required for such a task. Operating under imperial order, Assyrian and, city and Syrian porters had a relatively limited set of vessels shapes at their disposal. Bowls, goblets, and bottles used for service and consumption in rituals and banquets involving Assyrian elite members, and storage and pitoy for putting aside agricultural yield. These porters manufacture a standardized corpus of Assyrian and Syrian types, although local wares still comprise the lion's share of the assemblage. Elsewhere, I have pointed out the resemblance between Dan's pilaster building and the neo Assyrian administrative complex at Dur Sharukin, where room 65, the wine cellar, contained pitoy similar to those found in the pilasters building at Dan, that was thus used for the keeping the wine, oil, or other liquids, a storeroom where the king's wine or other liquids were deposited. For Assyrian, wine was not only sought after for its own sake but it also denoted status and rank. The possession of and distribution of wine became symbols of royal authority in the Assyrian heartland as well as in the provinces. Against this background, it is likely that wine vessels became economically and sociopolitically important in Assyrian provincial centers. The establishment of an Assyrian metropolis overlooked by an imperial residence in which the king's wine was stored, other administrative and leisure functions took place and the Assyrian officials were housed, 
created a clear demand for serving, drinking, and storage vessels in Assyrian style, associated with the Assyrian ceremonies and banquets, as well as with storage of agricultural products. In this manner, deported potters found a way to provincial centers such as Dan with only their technological knowledge and craft serving them as assets. This scenario explains the total absence of prototypes originating from the imperial core. Assyrian and Syrian vessels of Dan were locally produced by skilled deported potters. In the interaction between the colonizers, colonized and colonist specialists and artisans acted as intermediaries. Deported potters and artisans who possessed the required technological knowledge needed for such a change altered traditional Assyrian forms negotiating between imperial culture and local communities. Navigating their skill between the old and the new world, deported artisans were constantly redefining their identity. Preservation of the formal identity of deportees and craftsmen became possible through production of ceramic vessels that echo types known from those potters' homelands. Navigating cultural boundaries, deportees made conscious decisions with regard to the production of material culture and preservation of their identity. They selectively borrowed, retained, and created distinctive cultural forms that were missing in the local ceramic repertoire and were needed in daily life. To borrow an observation from whole house skins, Material cultural expression made being a Syrian a cultural and ethnic identity rather than just a political status, as is commonly thought. The cultural dimensions of this identity was all the more important for deportees. Forced to leave their homeland and previous ties by producing a Syrian pottery, these people were bonded to the ongoing project of imperialization, the only reality connecting them to their previous lives and upon which they became dependent. I bought you several slides of Area M. Uh, today we are trying to uh, reconstruct Area M, which I believe used as some kind of a refugee camp for the deportees that were brought to Dan by the Assyrians. And this is a reconstruction of, uh, 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 of the site. This is uh, our forthcoming uh, uh, project. It was through the daily practice of material culture that the Syrian deportees forged a sense of collective identity and gave it relevance for their lives in a new and unfamiliar territory. As Hannah Arendt said, refugees driving from one country to the other represents the vanguard of their people if they keep their identity. Thank you so much. Okay. Thank you, Yifa, for a wonderful talk. I guess the, the, the screen is now open for conversation. I'd like to ask a question. Yes. Elena. Hello. Hi. <laughs> Thank you. Fascinating. Um, and um, I'd say even uh, audacious. Uh, that is um, Noaz. Yes. With the, <laughs> the comparisons across uh, millennia. Um, I'm curious about your choice, the, the use of the term refugee. Um, it's a very loaded term that in our contemporary context has all sorts of meanings. Um, is there an equivalent, are there, I, I mean, are there any equivalent, is there any equivalent language in the Assyrian inscript, inscriptions that stands, that is a, you know, a signifier for what you're talking about when you're talking about refugees? Um, or is it a modern gloss to help us kind of understand you know, your interpretation of the reality. Um, uh, if you're talking about the potters who are sent as crafts, uh, who, I mean, 
you're talking about different classes of people, right? You're talking about people who are driven from their homes as a kind of punishment for uh, for um, disloyalty to the to the empire, and then you have people resettled who are on a on a mission. So those are two different classes of people. Um, are you applying the term refugee to to both those classes, or are you differentiating between them? Okay, so the term, the truth is that the term, uh, the term refugee is a modern term, of course. And uh, while I was looking for a proper anthropological comparanda, uh, I realized how difficult it is to try and import the conception of, of uh, refugees to deportations in antiquity, because uh, as you all know, the Assyrians were not great humanitarians, and <laughs> uh, uh, the, the psychological well-being of their subjects were not uh, a, a prime, let's say, uh, a priority uh, at all. Uh, so no, they didn't have they didn't have any specific uh, any specific uh, uh, name for these people who were forced. And we are talking about well, um, uh, we are talking Pampola, for example, the great Assyriologist estimates the uh, amount of deportees that were moved during the Neo-Assyrian period in millions of people. It's actually, it was a movement of people that changed the, the face of the, of the map of the ancient Near East. Yet there was no specific names for people who were forced to leave their homes and go to another land. They were just called by, either by their place of origins sometimes, or uh, as people, uh, or not even uh, uh, in this way, just, uh, you know, uh, as uh, anonymous. Uh, this is this is why I think archaeology becomes so important because uh, you know uh, I, I keep saying it, but inscriptions, royal inscriptions, inscriptions, the Bible were written by elite members, and they reflect experiences of elite and priorities of elite. While archaeology gives the voice of the silent majority. And the combination of text and context and archaeological context actually allows us to, to balance and give a more balanced view of, of the past. So thank you. I can't hear you, Ilana. Rega? Saying that uh, we have the term palit in biblical Hebrew, That's which I think right. refers to someone who's escaped from the battle from the battlefield, right? It's a right. More, narrow, more narrow meaning. Mm -hmm. That's right. Uh, Larry, I saw that you raised your hand. Would you like to, yes, please? Go. Okay, I wanted to ask a sort of uh, comparative question with the other big deportation out, but it's not quite as big a deportation out as some people might think, namely 597 and 586. And the question I'm asking is this, so the Assyrians, it seems to me, tell me if I'm right or wrong, are creating this tremendous intercultural exchange as a result of this military sort of policy. So, for example, we know about Israelites in Assyria by their names and stuff like that. Now, it seems to me that we don't have evidence, maybe I'm wrong, that's what I'm asking, for the two-way street cultural effect on Judea of that conquest. Is that a valid uh, contrast? Well, yes. Thank you for asking this question because it brings to, uh, well, I should, maybe I should have, have said that. It, it's uh, the strategy of deportation depends not only on on the uh, on, on the uh, on the king, but also on the empire, which means a Syrian strategy of uh, deportation that was uh, two di in two directions was completely different than the Babylonian uh, uh, deportation that was one-sided. The Babylonians who actually controlled the ancient Near East for much shorter span of time, didn't really care about the conquered territories and they didn't, they didn't have a, a long-term plan for these territories. Uh, and the, uh, the idea was not as economically and as uh, uh, strategically exploited as the Assyrian did. So as for the Babylonian deportations, we have evidence only for one direction, that is from Judah to Babylonia and not vice versa. 
and not vice versa. And, and I think that the secret of uh, when we ask ourselves how the Assyrians managed to control the entire ancient Near East for nearly 400 years from such a small triangle between the Euphrates and the Tigris rivers, I think that the answer is their, uh, their economic understanding and their ability to uh, adjust themselves to different ecological settings and to take care of all these small neglected areas uh, in the far remote uh, uh, parts of the empire. Now, I would just insert one, one comment here, which is it's interesting that maybe one could interpret that way some of the religious slash cultural effect that is opposed by various biblical books, because apparently what's going on is that the Assyrians, even on Judea, were creating this big influence, which itself caused inner turmoil about what we, I guess, could call Hellenization, borrowing the term from the later period. That's right. And, and it's not only that there was some sort of globalization processes to which the, 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 we can hear some kind of resistance in the prophets, in Yeshaya and other prophet, contemporary prophets, but there is also, we know today from biblical scholars that uh, uh, Assyrian, uh, 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 how to say, Assyrian uh, scholarly methods found their way to the Bible, in the book of Deuteronomy, for example, and in other books, we see echoes for the, the way Assyrians contracted their uh, um, alliances with, with, with their partners, the way, so it's, it, I think that the, the, the Assyrian influence on Judah uh, and on the kingdom, the northern kingdom is, is of, of Israel was far more deep than most people tend to think. We have another, thank you, Larry. We have another uh, question by just a minute. David? Yes. Uh, am I muted or am I, do you hear me? Yes. Okay. Um, thank you very much for your presentation. Um, something I'm curious about, so if I'm understanding you correctly, um, there's all this Assyrianizing kind of pottery and buildings on the coast. Um, we also see this in Syria as well. And if I'm hearing you right, Dan is kind of this link between the Syrian world and then the coast in the Southern Levant. Um, are there, so one site that I dug out in 2015 was Abel Bet Maka. And I wouldn't be able to tell you what the most recent stuff they're finding there is. But w is there stuff, that, like is there a Syrianizing pottery there that could maybe help your point about you, the kind of way you're seeing these structures at Dan? Not yet. Abel Bet Machar, our neighbors, you know, Nava and uh, uh, Bob are our neighbors to tell Dan. Uh, uh, the problem is that the, the site, the, the site of Abel Bet Machar is located on top of the ruins, as you know, of a village. And uh, it seems that until now, no seven, late, eight, late eighth, early seventh century BCE remains have been found. We are still eagerly waiting to see what happens with Abel, so I will keep you updated. Okay, thank you. <laughs> okay, more questions? Okay, uh, Alex, I think, uh, unless we have another question, I'm gonna I'm gonna just take take unmute myself to ask a question, and I wonder if it's it's a little bit of a follow up on, on Larry's um, question. I was trying to figure out how to raise my hand quickly, um, but instead I'll just unmute myself. Uh, I'm cu curious if you could if you could speak a little bit, kind of as as a secondary question to what Larry asked about, you know, how, how do you see the interplay between all the material we're seeing in the biblical text? Um, you mentioned a moment ago that the biblical text is the voice of the elite writers. Um, in, if, you were to, if you were to kind of reconstruct the, the kind of historical narrative, um, how would the biblical material and the other literary, literary material, not just biblical literature, but how would it go together with the, with the material culture that you're describing? I asked this kind of um, as somebody who works almost exclusively with, with textual material and really relies upon expertise of archaeologists to have something to say. And you know, I'm thinking in particular about you know, the ongoing conversations between archaeologists of ancient Israel and biblical scholars and the ongoing fights about how to write a history of ancient Israel. 
in this kind of constant refrain that we want to write a history of ancient Israel that essentially makes the biblical text secondary, right? In essence, um, you know, this is clearly a, a kind of sm small sliver of literary production by a small sliver of people. So I'm wondering if you have some kind of broader thoughts about how these two, the, the, the textual material and the material culture uh, intersect in, in kind of reconstructing the kind of broader conversation of history and culture and society. I know that's kind of a small, a, a small question for, for a, a Zoom, a Zoom uh, lecture, but if you have to have some general thoughts, I'm curious as to, as to how you kind of frame your approach to these issues. Well, the truth is that the dialogue between text and context is the subject of uh, the course that I teach at NYU Tel Aviv, and we are trying to, together with the students to provide a fair answer during the semester. Um, this, this is, of course, the, the, the $1 million question in the biblical archaeology today, uh, especially regarding, I think, the 10th and 9th centuries, but also it, it's also relevant for later, uh, later uh, periods. Um, it of course depends who you ask <laughs> and there are you know biblical archaeologists today and biblical scholars today are uh, are divided between several schools of thought some of them are called maximalists let's say others are called minimally minimalists those that are counted among the maximalist point of view hold uh, the assumption that the Bible should be given a credence upon the archaeological record and that uh, uh, if we really want, the, the, then the archaeological record can adjust itself to the textual evidence and they can live together. This is more a, what I call a harmonistic kind of uh, thought because we have some some periods, especially the Iron Age 1 and the Iron Age 2a from the 12th century to the 10th century, uh, in which we have big trouble with the picture depicted from the archaeological record. It doesn't, it doesn't seem to fit well the, the biblical account. Uh, moreover, in some cases, it seems to contradict the biblical account in a way. Uh, so I guess that if someone from, let's say, the Hebrew University would have given this talk, he would have said <laughs> that the, the Bible and archaeology live together, you know, peacefully, and there is there are hardly any troubles. But you are talking with uh, students of Nadav Naaman and Israel Fingerstein, and I'm very critical towards the biblical uh, evidence. Uh, I truly believe that the first time when the historiographic parts of the Bible were composed was the 7th century BC under the scepter of Josiah. And as such, the early, the early events in the history of Israel depict a reality of 7th century rather than 12th, 10th, 9th centuries. I think that they are placed didn't uh, offer, didn't didn't know much about the period and had to fill in the gaps uh, according to his theological and his uh, beliefs, which were, of course, revolutionary at times. The idea of one God to one place in uh, one city in Jerusalem. And I think that uh, had we have the book of the Chronicles of the Kings of Israel in the north, we would uh, <laughs> probably have uh, portrayed an entirely different historical sequence for the Northern Kingdom, for example. And I think Tel Dan is a great case study ever because this is the most notorious site in the Bible because of the golden calf that Jeroboam made and the Abu Dazara and the worship. And uh, uh, we have extremely interesting stuff coming out from Tel Dan from the Iron Age, attesting that, uh, for example, the cultic practices that were held there were completely kosher, but in, in a more Canaanite uh, way. So. I think that uh, I think that uh, as a scientific discipline, or sort of a scientific discipline, we ought to give credence to the archaeological record, and uh, uh, only then to try and match the text. Uh, it could be a Syrian text or biblical text, but I think that that the the evidence comes first. The only trouble is, of course, who interprets the evidence in what way. When you talk about pottery, you can date it to the 10th century, you can date it to the 9th century and stay, say that they are both valid, so. Great, thank, 
thank you so much. Uh, especially for the plug for our for our archaeology classes at NYU Tel Aviv. Other other questions or thoughts you want to share? Um, looking to. Well then, thank you, Yifat, for a wonderful talk. It was wonderful thank to see so many people here. Thank you. I wish you all health and good days, bright days. Hopefully, we will meet soon. Yes. And next time we'll have to we'll we'll do this. We'll have the, the follow up in person, either in Tel Aviv or in in New York. With much pleasure. Thank you. Thank you, guys. Thank Great you so much. Great to see so many people. <laughs> bye bye. Thank you. Thank you, Fat.